All right. Hey, thank you so much uh, for being with us. And thank you, Index Ventures, for hosting us. Uh, this is going to be a great talk about AI and ethics, a uh, very hot topic these days. Uh, I'd like to take a second to have our speakers introduce themselves. We have Mehran Sahami from the Stanford AI Lab and Adam Wenschel from Arthur. And it, I think it would help us if you just both gave us the pitch on yourselves. And maybe we'll start with Mehran. Uh, so my name is Miran Sahami. I'm a professor in the computer science department at Stanford University and also the associate chair for education here. Um, and prior to coming back, it's been about 15 years at Stanford now, I was a senior research scientist at Google for several years. So I also looked at deployment of AI out in the field as well as in the academic world. Fantastic. And Adam, go next. Yeah, my name is Adam Wenschel. I'm the CEO at Arthur. And I guess a little bit about myself, I started my career at DARPA, followed one of my CS professors over there and spent a couple of years doing AI research uh, about 20 years ago when it didn't really work all that well, but it was, a, it was a fun science project. And then from there, went out into the real world and, uh, you know, been working at various startups and tech companies in that time. And it's been exciting to see uh, in the last 10 years, some of the factors coming together. So where it actually is producing a lot of value in the world. And, and so um, my journey, I was actually my last startup I was acquired into a top 10 bank, Capital One, and shortly thereafter, I was asked to lead the, to build and lead the AI team. This was in 2015, 2016. And even though I've been doing AI for quite a while, it was the first time I was really doing it at a large scale in a way that really impacted people's lives and their financial livelihoods. And so it really uh, put, put a spotlight on some of these issues around ethics and AI and, and set me on a path to, uh, to founding Arthur, uh, which is a company that is a platform for monitoring AI performance, and that includes all sorts of AI performance, including is it performing uh, reasonably equitably across different groups, which is a, a big thing to look at, and can you explain what it's doing, things like that. So that's my okay. journey. Awesome. So I think we should get, let's start off by just defining what does it mean? What does AI ethics mean? It's so broad. And, you know, for both of you have been in tech industry for a long time, you know, I mean, ethics has been, you know, I mean, it's something that people have talked about for for years. So if we can sort of define what AI and ethics is and maybe how it differs from, you know, our concept of ethics and, and business in the past, it'd be great. So Mehran, maybe you want to start? Well, I think there's lots of different aspects to AI ethics. And if you think about ethics more broadly, it really brings up issues of value trade-offs. What are the things that are important to us societally? What are the kinds of norms that we want to promulgate? Um, what are the things that we think are important for people to live a good life in some sense? And when you distill that into the realm of AI, I think you find lots of issues where when you're applying, for example, machine learning models to make significant decisions about people's lives, it brings up questions about are, being, are people being treated equitably? Are you reinforcing particular patterns that may have existed historically in the data, which might have exhibited bias or might have exhibited particular people's proclivities toward making decisions a particular way? And you want to not reinforce that in the AI, in AI systems. There's also broader issues where if you think about AI and automation as potentially creating job displacement, you want to have an understanding of who's affected by that automation. What does that mean in terms of distributional consequences? Because some sectors and some people will be affected more by automation than others. And if we want to address that, not from the standpoint of thinking that means we need to stop automation, because I'm not a Luddite, I don't think we need to stop it in that sense, but we need to prepare for it properly. We need to think about how do we put systems in place, whether it's through education or reskilling, to be able to have people in particular sectors be able to move into other areas, especially when their jobs are going to be replaced by automation. And so it's issues like these that bring up value trade offs about what's important to us as a society that allows us to plan for thinking about how AI gets deployed down the road. Adam, how would well, you view it as something like affecting end users or customers? I mean, can it also be applied to maybe business models and maybe the way businesses even interact? Because like, if we sort of think about it as societal issues, then is it, are we generally just thinking more about the consumer tech companies, you know, as opposed to infrastructure companies, I don't know, who generally don't really want to be involved in these sort of conversations? Yeah, certainly when you have models that are affecting humans, that's a, a huge, obvious impact. But but even if you, they're not affecting people, there's all sorts of repercussions. I mean, Mara mentioned you know potential job loss and automation. Um, we have not seen much of it, but it's certainly certainly worth talking about it and and, uh, and and kind of understanding and, and thinking about. Um, there's also issues, all sorts of other issues around you know the expense of 
um, training some of these models and the environmental impact for, for that type of thing. And so uh, I do think that, the, but you know, as you, as you alluded to, the models that directly affect people are the ones where the, the impacts are really obvious and, and need to be you know, very carefully considered because you're getting deployed right now without, um, you know, without, without, much, uh, without much input. And you know, I make no claims to be an ethicist, but just as an AI practitioner, it's not hard to see sort of all the ways that you know, your model is operating in society as part of a system that and you can either help kind of nudge the world in the right direction and, and sort of address some of these, uh, these issues, or you can automate them and perpetuate them, which is not where we want to be. Well, help me understand a little bit, um, just, you know, what is what distinguishes AI from other sorts of technologies when you come to these ethical issues? I've had conversations with AI researchers in the past who are saying, like, why, why are we in the spotlight? You know, <laughs> this is a technology, you know, I should, you know, like, why, why is it just, it's not just us. So I don't know, help us understand that a little bit more clearly. Yeah, I think, uh, I think, I think AI does deserve the extra scrutiny as and for the okay. reason it's, it's replacing um, a, a lot of sort of to human decision making with automated decision making, and these are probabilistic models that are that are making it based on historical data, which has baked in all sorts of biases in, in, in itself, and was developed by people who may have who, who almost certainly will have their own biases that get incorporated into it. So, um, it's pretty unique in that way because it's it's learning learning patterns, it's making probabilistic decisions, and it's replacing human based decision making processes in a way that a lot of other technologies just don't. Aaron, what, what do you see? Because I mean, people were studying bias and statistics for years. I mean, I think there's people even working on bias like in just decades ago, but what, why it, how come it seems like it's just when this technology is de de deployed now, it's like all this stuff sort of happens unexpectedly when I would assume that people were, you know, statisticians generally knew what the idea of bias was in numbers. Yeah, I think there's two critical differences now. One is measurements and the second is scale. So if you think about it from the standpoint of measurements, it's difficult, for example, when you had bias before that people were making biased decisions to open up someone's head and try to understand how that bias is manifested or how that bias would creep up if you tried to have them make the same decision on the same person down the road or someone who's slightly different. But these are the kinds of things you can actually measure in AI systems, right? You have a model and so you can try tweaking the data and seeing how the model responds. You can see how the model is actually changing over time as you're giving it different data. You can test the model on thousands or millions of decisions to get a sense of, is there bias for particular groups of people? The kinds of things you couldn't do with a human being before. So there's a sense of scale there and an ability to measure it in a way you just couldn't before. And part of the reason why the spotlight's being shined on AI is because it has gotten to a place where it is making these significant decisions more and more. And in many situations in which people are unaware that these decisions are being made for them by an AI in the background. And so if you look at the history of technology, there's lots of places where when a technology achieved a particular scale, it came under massive scrutiny, right? right. Simple, simple example is the, the road system with cars, right? We have all kinds of regulation around cars. Um, that didn't exist when cars were first invented. But now it's the same thing with AI. We didn't have much regulation when AI was first invented. Now it's coming under scrutiny because it's having an effect on millions of people. And we'll stay on this topic of AI, but that just means the next logical question. Does this mean Web3? We're going to have to, these questions about ethics and blockchain and all that in the future? Because that really <laughs> hasn't been too much in the spotlight. Well, it's going to come up. I mean, as Adam alluded to with some of the environmental impacts of training large models, there's certainly environmental impacts for mining various cryptocurrencies and maintaining the blockchain. So all these issues are going to come up, you know, again, just in a different context. And also it's with, you know, uh, affecting national currencies and things like that. So there's yeah, there, there are huge impacts for sure. Um, Definitely. Definitely. Well, well, tell me about like, you know, the idea of model monitoring, because I've just noticed in recent years, you know, people are, it's, it's become a hot space. There's a lot of companies I know that's sprouting who are doing this. And sometimes people would pitch it as sort of AI bias tools. And I've heard some AI research being like, it's a little misleading. I mean, I don't know. How do you view the idea of model monitoring as it relates to ethical behavior? Yeah. So when we talk about model monitoring, there's sort of three major pillars that we're talking about. One is performance monitoring to make sure it's performing well, right. it's being reasonably accurate. And Second is uh, around explainability and interpretability. You know, can you can you bring provide some transparency to these sort of oftentimes inherently black box models in a way that you know people can understand what they're keying off of, why they're making certain decisions, uh, especially the people who are being affected or having to consume the outcomes of these models. And then the last one is around bias, which in some ways is a lot like 
uh, performance, but just by demographic, right? Is your model performing equally well kind of among different groups? Is it providing reasonable access to similar outcomes uh, among different groups? So those are the, the areas we focus on. And I think the reason it's become hot so recently is because, you know, if you talk about like AI and industry, really it was, you know, the wave started five-ish years ago. Um, and uh, the at that time, like people basically had to find the right talent. They had to figure out how to like get the data. They had to figure out how to build these models. And it's just really in the last year or two that they started to really kind of start to get these in production outside of maybe, you know, a handful of like the large fang companies you know you're seeing a much broader sort of deployment of ai technologies and uh and so you know once you start to put them in production you realize you're, you're actually like that's not you're not done that's actually the starting line right and there's like all these things that you have to think about to maintain and these systems and to monitor the way they kind of affect the world and the funny thing is the world's not a static place it changes it's very dynamic you have global pandemics and you have you know weather patterns and all sorts of other things that affect the world and so um, I think that that is what resulted in sort of this this area getting so much um, attention recently. Marab, what what are your views of these sort of tools that are sprouting up? You know, and how does it sort of relate to the type of work academics do? You know, sort of researching some of the you know pitfalls, large models, or you know, how do you see those uh, two you know working with each other? Yeah, there's certainly a co-evolution where, you know, things are developed in academic labs and then they work their way into industry. And likewise, we see the problems that people are working on in industry and that informs directions for future research. You sure. know, I think the kinds of things Adam's talking about are critical and they're becoming basically, you know, essential table stakes to play in the game of AI because there's a real liability issue, right? If someone develops models and they don't do this kind of testing and they deploy them at scale and there's bias involved, they open themselves up to a level of liability and business risk. And so from that pure standpoint, from the pure, pure business standpoint, this is part of the price of building AI systems. You're not only just getting data, you're not just building models, you're not just hiring talent, but you have to do this kind of uh, testing for performance, for bias, for understandability and transparency. And I think what we're going to see longer term is even moving beyond that. The questions that we're going to get into are, how do we want to answer some of the value trade-offs that come up that allow us to say we could tweak algorithms in different ways to get different outcomes? What are the actual outcomes that societally we want to have. And so that be, will become not just a matter of technology, it'll become a matter of politics, because it'll involve getting different stakeholders to give their input into the process as what's the outcome we want to see societally. And then we have to adjudicate among those different value preferences to come up with a solution. Well, one, one conflict in values that sort of comes up a lot when I talk with folks who do AI is, you know, privacy, anonymizing some data, anonymizing it from racial or you know, gender data like that. But then when you do that, it's very difficult to see how the bias gets manifested in the model. I've heard this from talking with, you know, different online advertisers and, you know, people in that area. And they said that's kind of a big issue right now is that when we have this idea where we want to, we want to rep, you want to make sure that we have an idea of data privacy, but if that somehow conflicts with the way that you can sort of study if the model is behave, how it's behaving on different demographics, um, I'm just curious, like, at, what do you see as far as academic research into that area or, you know, how we deal with that dilemma? Because I think that is a common problem with a lot of companies right now. Well, I think, you know, part of the issue there is, is understanding the actual setup, right? So you can have data that's not anonymous with respect to gender or race, but that those particular attributes are not used to train the model. They're used on the back end to determine whether or not the model, when you run that data through, actually exhibits racial or gender bias. So it's important to keep track of that data because you need it from the auditing perspective. You need it on the back end to be able to look at these kind of distributional effects of the model. But there is actually an ongoing debate about whether or not those should be input features into the model. There's a notion of fairness called anti-classification, which comes from the legal literature, which is basically you should not discriminate based on those kinds of protected attributes, like in particular contexts, age, or gender or race. Um, yeah. In other contexts, it may actually make sense to use them. For example, in medicine, knowing someone's gender actually makes a big difference as to what kind of therapy they should receive. And so understanding you know, that notion of what is fair in what context is exactly the place where we need the societal input to understand things. And then we also need the technical tools to do the measurement. Hey, Adam, how are you dealing with this? I mean, how are companies dealing with this, just using these monitoring tools with this issue of you know, anonymized data and bias. 
Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, and we see this firsthand in a number of industries like financial services, where you know, for many, for 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 the last couple of decades, the the um, the way the regulation has been implemented was to very explicitly never collect any demographic data, right? What, what we now call fairness through unawareness, um, which it turns out really doesn't work that well. You do need to collect that data. And you know how it's handled is a, is a subject of much debate, like whether it needs to be really strictly kind of siloed off. Um, as Maria mentioned, there's some that are some people who believe you should actually put it as inputs into the model, even if it's not um, to get signal. I mean, some people are, are you know suggesting that you should in your objective function for your, your training routine that you should also incorporate notions of fairness into that. So there's a lot of different ways that that you could potentially use it, but you need to you need to have it in order to measure it. And it's a real problem because in these industries, like a lot of these systems are old legacy systems, mainframes and things like that. And they've been hard coded sort of not to collect this stuff. And so now to, to really kind of you know turn the ship and start collecting it and really start to so you can actually measure it and understand it uh is is going to take years um and so luckily there's other areas like healthcare that, that Ron mentioned where they where they do have that data and so i think in, in that space you're really seeing people um uh you know kind of get on the forefront and uh and, and actually use that to actively measure and in some cases actively mitigate algorithmic bias which is which is really exciting well, I would imagine a lot of the regulated industries have already ways, like, I mean, they know how to collect data. They've been subject to abiding by certain laws and regulations. And I'm, so I'm curious about like, how, how has the concept of big data sort of changed over the years with AI? You know, we used to talk about big data as sort of more than the machine learning. And there's still, if you talk to some consultants, they'll still say like, well, companies are sitting on like 90% of data, you know, is so much or so much data. But just knowing that there's these ethical dilemmas with how this data was collected, what is the demographics of the data? I mean, how does this sort of change the way that the industry was sort of thinking about this concept of like, just amass as much data as you possibly can, because, you know, you can turn this data into gold at some point. I think there's still a tendency toward, you know, the notion of data maximization, right? So you gather all the data you can uh, legally, right? There are still regulations like FERPA and HIPAA, depending on the context that you're in. And then you try to figure out what to do with the downstream. The important thing, if someone's actually doing that, is to understand, well, one, there's a liability for privacy issues, right? The more data you collect, the more potential liability you create if there's a data breach, if some of that data is released. But more importantly than the, the liability around it is understanding the provenance of the data. Where did that data come from? How was it collected? What are the motivations of the people involved that were involved, say, in the decisioning process in which that data is being gathered? What was the context? And so what oftentimes happens is when this data just gets put into a database, that history is lost, that provenance is lost. And that can be a critical factor in whether or not there is bias in the data or what sorts of patterns are actually found or what's being perpetuated. And it's not a place where there has been as much effort to think about how do we maintain the integrity of that provenance as opposed to just building the model itself. Adam, your thoughts. Yeah, I agree. It's, you know, the, the, um, there's all sorts of issues emerging now, especially with areas like facial recognition and many other areas about the use of, of the data and where it's collected and, uh, you know, and, and all, as Merrim uh, alluded to, all the bias that's, you know, that, that kind of one of the many ways it, it, uh, it, it finds its way in there is, is based on how the data is collected. And so I think these we're, we're still kind of very early in, in, you know, solving these issues. And uh, I think there's going to have to be a lot of, a lot of reckoning with, you know, this historical data that, that's going to be in our future. Is it, is it logical to, does it still make sense to move fast? Like you can still build a lot of things, like just knowing that there's all these sort of guardrails in place. I mean, or has that notion even changed too? So, you know, we always say like when we, when we work, the companies we work with that are the most successful are the ones that kind of view governance and guardrails as an enabler and not a, uh, and not quicksand, right, for running in. The ones that are struggling are the ones where it's quicksand. And so, you know, it's, it's a bit like having anti-lock brakes or traction control, right? You can, you can drive a little faster if you, if you have these safety systems in place and you're confident that they're going to, they're going to be able to catch mistakes um, when they, when they occur. So, yeah, I mean, we see, like, we think it's actually absolutely critical to have these, these kind of guardrails in place, good governance process, the right organization. Um, but the ultimate goal is then it allows you to move fast without breaking things. And so you can run your business more like a Kaggle competition where, you know, you're deploying models and you're having them compete against each other and you're promoting the ones that are effective. Um, but no, with the knowledge that if, if there's like bias perpetuated in one or if there's other sorts of negative impacts that uh, they'll get caught before it affects people. 
is it should it, we just have an assumption like change the whole notion of AI and ethics to like the idea of zero trust and what you essentially build your products knowing at some point there's going to be a vulnerability because you know that there's some inherent flaw in it it just changes the way you sort of develop the product itself is this like the way that people should view you know building a machine learning model we just know at some point it's going to spew something out you know that we that may not agree with the way that we as a company want to stand for but I, I don't know what are your thoughts both anyone absolutely well, I think that Go, go, go ahead. ahead. No, you go ahead. Yeah. All right. Okay. That's, uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, 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 no model developer can anticipate every single uh, situation that a model is going to be asked to decide in when it sees the real world. And the historical data, you know, the data you're seeing in the real world does not always match the historical data you're trained off. In fact, if, as more time goes on, frequently those two diverge more and more. And so, yeah, there's, you, you need to absolutely operate that like this model is going to encounter um, situations that it wasn't necessarily prepared for, and uh, and in that situation, you, you have to be highly suspicious of the uh, the inferences it makes. Merrick, what about you? Yeah, I think that's you know exactly right, and, and that requires you know not just being able to to do some auditing on the model when you deploy it, but to also do some real time monitoring as it's making decisions, so you can see you know is there drift in the data that's being presented to it, and so it's drifting in terms of the kinds of decision it makes. Is it doing something different in the field than you expected in the lab? And so it's important to think of that process, not just from the standpoint of gather the data, build the model, test it, and then you're good to go. But that testing process is continuous. And that means the feedback to be able to retrain the model and redeploy has to be continuous as well. I mean, you, you've sort of straddled both worlds and, you know, private sector and, and academia. What do you think maybe academia, the people who study AI and ethics, maybe misunderstand about the complexities of running a business? You know, and then maybe I'll flip that question to Adam. Uh, make, think, go you know, one of the, the big complexities is the speed and is the competitive nature, right? So in academia, there is much kind of a more deliberative pace, right? You're setting your own agenda for research or setting your own time frame for when things uh, get deployed. There isn't a commercial interest in the same way that there is in the uh, industrial world. And so I think, you know, thinking about in industry, you know, things there were measured on the order of, you know, generally days or weeks or something for a project. And in academia, they're measured in terms, of semesters, quarters, or years, right? Which was very much a kind of shock moving from one world to the other world. But I think it part of that deliberative nature gives you the time to be able to reflect on what are some of the externalities that are generated by this technology that you may not be thinking about when you're thinking, you know, you're in the race to deploy them in industry. And so I think that's the place where a closer collaboration actually makes a lot of sense because some of the deliberative work in academia can help with thinking about what the guardrails in industry should be, as Adam mentioned, so you can still continue to run fast, but you don't go off the rails. And Adam, how much do you like, uh, you know, take credence in the academic world and AI ethics? Is it something that you're keeping your eyes on, you know, or is it you're just pretty busy running your own company? As it is? Uh, we, we've, we've, uh, you know, AI, you really need to have a foot in both worlds. And we've definitely done that. We have our chief scientist, Dr. John Dickerson, is on the faculty at the University of Maryland and helps us out. And we have multiple PhDs on staff and, and, and we regularly publish papers. Um, and, you know, had postdoc fellows and things like that. So it's critically important. And, you know, in, in terms of the difference between academia and the real world, like a lot of times in academia, you see um, techniques and ideas that are pioneered, which is great. But oftentimes there's a little gap between um, the way that the problems are approached in academia and the real world. There's a little more complexity and nuance in the real world. So a couple examples. Um, we have a large uh, Fortune 100 healthcare provider who, you know, one of the things they do is predictively call people, call people who the models tag is like high risk for certain heart, for certain health conditions, right? So the heart disease or diabetes, and they call up and say, hey, if you're at high risk, you know, here's some things you can do to lower your risk with these things. And it's good for everyone. It's good for the patient. It's good for the, keeps them out of the hospital. It's good for the health insurer because they have to pay for them to be hospitalized. But, you know, in the fair note, we, you know, with automated bias mitigation, where you actually take the outputs of the model and make them adhere to certain fairness constraints, um, the, the, uh, the, a lot of the literature didn't take into account the fact that there's like oftentimes a constrained supply. So, you know, if you have a classifier that's saying, oh, you know, shift it, like call these people to give them access to this proactive healthcare, you might only have like 20 doctors who can make those calls. And so there's a limited number of calls to go around. So you can't just like bump a bunch of people into the call these people for proactive healthcare. 
Uh, and so in those cases, you know, we actually have to take the academic literature and just extend it a little bit, build off of it to, uh, to meet some of the real world scenarios that we see come up over and over again. And Mar Marin, what do you, how do you see like uh, ethics sort of changing over the next few years? I mean, do you see it sort of becoming sort of commonplace the way risk and regulation is at a company? I mean, you could the theoretically like, you know, if, if a company is worried they're going to get sued, then I would imagine like they would buy, you know, it's, it's like complying to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Like we have to do that. We have to comply to it. Like if there's a rule, you will comply to it. You know, versus I think there's, at least in the past, ethics was kind of like a PR problem. You know, if you look at some corporate filings of companies, they'll say like, you know, the blow, the potential blowback if like, you know, one of our models perform, you know, is biased. And it's sort of a PR pro like problem. But I wonder if like you're sensing it more that there's these regulatory scrutiny is coming and how that's going to change the conversation about ethics. Yeah, I think there's, there's both bottom up aspects and top down. Um, from the bottom up aspect, I think it's it's instructive to kind of look at history of software development, right? So if you sure. think in the early days, people were hacking code, and at some point, people realized the notion of quality assurance and testing was important. And so as part of the, the product life cycle, now we have a significant quality assurance function in terms of building and deploying software, right? You no serious software house, just build software without going through a QA process and releasing it. And then a few years after that, people realized that usability was a big thing, right? And understanding what your customers want, how they interact with the product. And so now most products bakes into their life cycle is also a usability testing component. And probably most recently, probably about 10, 15 years ago, we saw heavy emphasis on security, right? So looking at vulnerabilities in your product, where there might be data leaks, what kinds of data are you capturing? Um, and that's now baked into, you know, many software outfits process. And I think ethics is now the next thing that's going to be added that serious software companies won't deploy software without having an understanding of ethics review, without an understanding about societal externalities that are being created because these are real liabilities for the company. And at the same time, in addition to the, the bottom up, you're going to get top-down regulation that says, we're going to have to have things like algorithmic auditing for certain kinds of algorithms. We're going to have to have various guardrails on what data is collected and how it's maintained and how it gets aged out, for example. And so these two confluent, there will be confluence of these two factors. And, and the notion of ethics is really going to become codified in the software engineering process. Absolutely second that. And we're actually seeing that in the real world where, um, you know, we hear stories all the time from some of the large public companies we work with where some of these really large institutional investors are starting at investor meetings to ask the corporations like, you know, what, how are, what are your tech ethics practices? What are your AI ethics practices? Because, you know, they see that this is a huge risk on the horizon and, and they want to invest in the companies that are kind of getting ahead of it, being proactive about it, not waiting till they end up uh, the New York Times to, uh, to action off of it. At, well, Adam, I, I mean, our investors, at, what type of questions are they asking more? You know, like what are some pointed questions that people, if you're running a company, you might expect to hear from an investor about AI ethics? Yeah, I mean, they'll, they'll say like, how we, as you guys are deploying these, what sort of practices do you have in place to make sure that they're not being biased or that they're not going to go out of control or, you know, things like that, which all, all things that you know, have been seen to happen in the real world. So, yeah, pretty, pretty broad set of questions. I think it's still, you know, the, er, the early days for these investors, but, but the fact that they're, they're starting to ask and, and these, these, um, these topics are starting to become top of mind, both from investors and in the boardrooms too, you know, we see uh, when I when I was at Capital One, we had to brief the board on what we were doing with AI, both you know what, what the strategy was, but also um, what our risk posture was around it, because uh, that's what boards are, are there for, and, and that we see that at other companies as well, where there these things get reported up to a, a board level, and you know they're they're the amount of leverage these models are now driving, especially in areas like financial services and healthcare, is is significant, and you know problems there would have a significant impact on on the companies that they're being deployed at. Mara, what, what are some trends that you're seeing in academia right now as far as AI and ethics that, you know, that are you know, interesting to you? Um, I'd say there's, there's continuing work going on around the notions of fairness and bias, trying to understand it from different perspectives and different tools around it, and it, in particularly you know, what domains it tends to show up more than in others. Um, I think there's also a significant amount of work at looking at applications of AI, and that brings up different ethical issues in different domains. 
but it's it's you know we've reached kind of a, a we turned a corner a few years ago as Adam alluded to where the efficacy of these systems has gotten so good that people are just seeing all the different ways in which they can be deployed and that's good and bad it's good because there is potentially lots of efficiencies that are created in the system um, and it's bad at the same time because there's lots of places that uh, actually have these these dark recesses where the data actually encodes a lot of uh, you know unsavory information and the more we build that into models and deploy it at scale the more we're going to see negative societal externalities and so I think the place where we're seeing more academic research is trying to identify some of these things before they get deployed at scale. Right. And what areas would that be? You know, what are the hotspots that we that, you know, people are looking at right now before they get deployed at that scale? Right. So health is a big one. Right. So looking at various kinds of medical data, um, trying to do diagnosis in various ways. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, activity recently around the criminal justice system. Part of that's actually driven top down. From California, for example, we had uh, uh, SB 10, which was a bill to actually take bail decisions and, and move them over into the algorithmic world out of the cash bail world. So the idea was to end cash bail. Um, and so a lot of people were looking at trying to understand the impact of these algorithms. And, and oddly enough, this bill actually passed without there being any comprehensive studies as to the impact of bias in using algorithms for bail, right? And it kind of seems shocking that it's one of the most populous states in the country would actually do that. But that's what happened. And eventually there was backlash from a group of people, sort of odd bedfellows, both the, the cash bail industry and a lot of civil society groups got together to see SB 10 repealed because they thought that there wasn't enough understanding of the algorithmic impacts of, of um, you know, deploying this for, for bail decisions. So that's yeah. the place where more academics get involved, right, to, to study yeah. these issues so we can make more informed decisions. Adam, what are you hearing from customers? I mean, what are the issues that are on the uh, top of their mind? Uh, I think those ones are, are huge. I think the, um, you know, the, a, a lot of it's around performance and bias. There's areas like people analytics is, is one that's really um, there's a lot of attention on right now. So using like algorithmic hiring, screening candidates, looking for- Yeah, that's a big deal. Factors. That's a huge yeah. deal. And I mean, what, where do you see that? You know, there's a big law that just will, you know, it'll come in effect in 2023 in New York governing hiring. And, you know, just people I've talked to say that might have a lot of big effects because essentially companies will have to disclose to people that they were using AI as part of the hiring, you know, process. And so I'm just, what, what are your thoughts on that? Where do you see um, AI and hiring and, you know, that sort of HR use case um, morphing into? Yeah, so I think that I, I do think that you know, as we kind of start off with this this presentation, with like algorithms can be used there safely. But I think that if if you don't take very explicit steps to what to you know monitor for and mitigate bias, then the odds are they are they're they're not going to be a, you know very ethical at all, and they are going to open up companies to liability. And so um, you know, I, I think that. Uh, when they, as people are developing, whether they're developing models in house or they're buying third party products, their companies are liable for any potential bias regardless. And so we're seeing just a lot of interest where customers, either the ones that are very large, are developing their own algorithms and they're asking you know, for help kind of monitoring for bias and mitigating it, or they're in the next you know, tier down and they're buying third party products and they're saying, you know, we're not, we can't deploy this third party product that uses probabilistic decision making without some sort of solution where we can like feel confident that we're not exposing ourselves to a bunch of risk. Merton, is there, is there a conflict between just the type of business model and the idea that you can act sort of ethically with AI? Like, and is there, is there any, like, you know, if your business model is something, you know, what's in the, in the news a lot, online advertising, there's always questions of like how ethical is the whole area, but like, I mean, if you're if you're if you're using all the monitoring tools, you know you're you're looking at all the data. Does that negate just the idea of what general business ethics, you know, on, on the running a company? And I want to sort of ask that just because I want to bridge the two. What are business ethics and technology ethics, you know? And yeah, I mean, there's a notion of measurements, and there's a notion of what you do about it. Right. So what are acceptable levels of bias? Right. Are there acceptable levels of bias? Because you're never going to get to a situation where everything is exactly equally distributed across all groups. And so understanding, I mean, this is where we get in sort of the, the political notions of ethics, right, is you can have a particular measure and say, okay, I want to get this measure as close to 50-50 as possible or whatever the case may be. But at the end of the day, that's not going to happen. And, you know, 
the, the real world is a messy place. So what are you willing to accept in terms of the things that you measure? And I think the place where we run into some difficulty sometimes in the business world is that there's such a drive toward scale, there's such a drive toward revenue generation and profitability that when someone's confronted with an issue that says, look, there's a little bit of bias here, but it generates a lot more revenue, right? There's a potential for that revenue to sort of trump the other factors involved and push a, uh, an organization more and more toward making decisions where they're focused on particular metrics that they're trying to optimize rather than understanding what's in the big picture, right? And, you know, classic example of this is the Ford Pinto, right? Where the people who were working on the Pinto were so pushing toward creating a low cost car and trying to keep the cost of materials down that that became their goal in itself. And they lost this larger goal of what it actually meant in terms of safety when this thing was you know, deployed in the real world. Those are the places where things really can fall down ethically when in, in the deployment of systems. So, I mean, Adam, who, whose job is it at the company to walk through and monitor the models? You know, if it sort of touches every aspect of the business, who is like the person responsible? Yeah, so I mean, you know, there, there's a risk management, is, there's like books written about this, right? With like first line, second line, third line of risk management, where you have like the, the people actually deploying the systems, some sort of compliance function, maybe an audit function. So there's multiple tiers of risk management. Um, I think that at some level, you know, the, the, the boards are going to get more involved. If you've seen like cybersecurity is a good analog where, you know, it wasn't really on most boards radar until the 2014 target breach. And then all of a sudden, you know, after that, the, 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 you know, fortunately the CEO lost his job and um, it became what top three issue for, for boards worldwide. And I think that over time, as uh, you know, some more issues emerge with, uh, with applications of AI that weren't fully considered before being put into production, I think you're going to see a similar trend around this. Where do you see this moving into, Marilyn? Let's say like two years from now, are you hopeful? Are you, I mean, what, what keeps you um, optimistic if you are optimistic? Yeah, I actually am optimistic, oddly enough. I'm, you know, maybe too optimistic, but I am. I do think we're going to see a confluence of two things. I think we're going to see more regulation around these things. I think there's a policy window in DC right now where um, both the left and the right, despite the function that exists in DC, want to do something about technology. Um, right. And so after they've called a bunch of hearings and stuff, it's just more embarrassing to them to not do anything. So I think they will do something. And the question is, what is it, what is what do they do? And does it make sense technically? Because sometimes what we've seen in policy proposals in the past is that they seem well intentioned. They just don't make sense from a technological standpoint. And I think the place that this needs to play out in the next couple of years is we actually need to have industry take more seriously the notion that they're actually going to be regulated because they are. And at the same time, have technologists involved in the policymaking process so that we actually get policies that make sense with respect to the intent that we want to see. But I do think it's a high likelihood that it's going to happen. It's going to create guardrails, which will be good for us, assuming the policy actually gets made with an understanding of technology. What's an example of a poorly written policy, like in history, that gives us, a, you know, an idea? I've ha I've had this conversation with technologists in the past who then you know they say like we don't want them to over rush on this thing, you know. But what's an example of some poorly written policies in the past that have? I can give you a very concrete one. So um, James Vaca, who was a council member in New York City, very well intentioned, was getting questions from his constituents about the choices that algorithms were making about like which kids were getting sent to which schools, and he didn't have a good answer. So he wanted to have a policy where there would actually be transparency with respect to algorithms. The problem was the way that policy was written, the way to create transparency was to publish the code for the algorithm. And if you think about a machine learning algorithm, publishing the code for something that does machine learning, when you don't know what the data is, you don't know what the model is, you don't know how it's being deployed, doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't address the problem. Most people can't even look at the code and understand what it was doing. Even if you made the model available with all the parameters in the model, most people couldn't take a look at that and understand what it was doing. So there, it was a very good intention, but the policy ultimately didn't pass because it didn't solve the problem that it was intended to. 
And so I think if you get technology people involved to think about, you know, the issues that Adam's talking about, how do we think about what sort of auditing you actually want on an algorithm? What kind of safeguards do you need to put in place to guarantee the processes you went through to say, we tested for these particular kind of things. We measured these values. Here are the things that come out. Here's what we think is an acceptable level of uh, risk or, you know, whatever measure is getting coded in that policy. You can make much better decisions about what you actually what kind of transparency you create and who's it's in service to than just saying we should publish source code for an algorithm. Adam, like what is your take on the sophistication of uh, policymakers, you know, as this issue has just become more, you know, front and center? Yeah, I think it's increasing. It's increasing pretty rapidly. Um, so, you know, people like uh, Ron Wyden and others are really kind of taking, uh, making an effort to really kind of understand these issues deeply. We saw there were some recent uh, people joining the, the FTC and, and places like the CFPB that are, um, have, have, you know, solid backgrounds in AI and AI policy. And so I'm optimistic. It, 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 there is a learning curve, right? And it'll take them some time, but, but I do see positive progress on the front. So I don't know if this is just a cynic in me, but I would, I would think that with, you know, decentralized web and web three that, it probably excites a lot of like founders because it's like, I don't have to deal with this stuff, you know, like all this stuff about regulation and like compliant, like I can just build this stuff on new infrastructure and like part of it, what makes it exciting. Why should the, why, I mean, tell me why that is <laughs> misguided thinking. <laughs> yeah, Maron, go, go for it. <laughs> just because it's decentralized doesn't mean it's not regulated. It's kind of like, you know, it, let's take it a simple example. I, I always like this analogy personally is, you know, the advent of cars. You could say, well, now cars take, you know, the notion of transportation out of the hands of the railroads, which are kind of a centralized control. Now everyone can just get their own car and deliver what they want wherever they want, right? Does that mean that the roadway system was not going to be regulated? We were just going to say, you know, drive wherever you want. It's fine. It's okay. No, we created lanes, we created stop signs, we created stoplights, we created speed bumps, we created this whole system of regulation around the decentralized notion of people driving their own cars. And guess what that system created? It created a set of safety where everyone's much safer driving on the road now. You still have a question whether or not you wanna drive or not, right? That's still your personal choice. But if you wanna do it, you're doing it in a highly regulated system that creates a greater sense of safety for everyone involved. I think that's the same place we get to in decentralized world of web 3.0. When it takes off sufficiently, you're going to get regulatory guardrails around it, even though it's decentralized. Adam, I mean, what are your thoughts? I find the, the two communities are really, it's funny, is like I, there's not a lot of cross pollination within like, you know, really intense deep learning practitioners and like, you know, blockchain enthusiasts, like, you know, <laughs> I mean, you just don't see those worlds colliding as much, but like, I mean, what do you think as far as the future, you know, is presumably if this type of uh, Web3 takes off, you know, and what, what that means to AI? Yeah, no, it's funny that over the last few years, those have been like the two really hype technologies, right? And, oh, yeah. and <laughs> you know, we, I get asked about all the time. And I'm like, hey, I'm an AI. I don't know. And I think, honestly, I think that there is like a little bit, I don't know if it's a rivalry, but, um, but uh, you know, there's something I, I know for you know, believe they believe strongly in AI, and there's some skepticism about some of the more overhyped uh, aspects of, of Web3 and blockchain. So it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. <laughs> Do you think there's any, I mean, what are we still over the AI hype? I mean, are we experiencing still like a sort of, um, you know, over promising of the capabilities? I mean, what, how, do, how do both of you see it? I mean, we, there's definitely some of that for sure, but I think what's different, you know, the AI has been through some uh, several very famous periods of overhype and AI winners. And what's different this time around is even though there are certainly plenty of instances of overhype, um, there, are, there are also some very, very real world value producing examples that are like really meaningful or actually a really broad set of those. So there, you might see a little bit of a, a retraction of some of the hype, um, but it's not going to be like AI winners of, of past where, you know, it was sort of, um, I remember when I graduated with my comp side, Degree. It was sort of like seen as this very quixotic tilting at windmills type of endeavor. And people would joke, you know, hey, oh, you're an, you're an AI, you're great at predicting the past and things like that. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think we're going to go back to those days. How about yourself, Marin? 
Yeah, I think, you know, same thing. When I was in graduate school, there was this running joke that AI was the set of all the things in computer science that didn't work. Right. Uh, so that's why they were, it was AI, because we still needed that intelligence to make it work. But I think, as Adam mentioned, we've already gotten to a place where we see AI having significant commercial impact in the world. There's probably some areas in which it is overhyped. That's probably true. Certain domains, certain verticals. And what will happen over time is the particular domains in which AI can really is a really good fit and really shines will take off even further and in the places where it's overhyped we'll probably see it sort of dry up but that doesn't mean ai in general is going away in the you know sense of like the 70s and 80s where there was the ai winter adam talks about it's more in the sense that it's now finding the right domains where ai is actually a good fit for for making progress so we just have a few minutes left and so maybe we'll end it by each one of you give a couple tips that you know new companies should think about when they're thinking about AI and ethics it's a very broad topic what are tips to get them started on this Marin maybe go first and Adam you uh, follow up. Well, the thing I would say is build into your DNA now an understanding of both data policy. So thinking about the fact that, you know, the general data protection regulation in Europe, we're probably going to have something very similar to that in the United States. If you want to look at a blueprint, check out what's happened in California with the California Consumer Protection Act. Um, but there will be regulation coming around data gathering and there will be regulation around AI. And the earlier you can bake that into your business processes where you think about data is not just something you gather, but you have a whole process around and you have a management structure around. And the same thing around building models in AI, that this is really a process. It's not a one shot and get it out and we think it works, but you need to constantly evaluate and refine, make that part of your DNA. And I think you'll be much better off in the long run. And Adam. So I definitely agree with the process point. And that's, you know, one of the things we really help try to help people enable is that kind of ongoing, you know, iterative feedback, continuous, um, continuous improvement. You know, for us, what we always tell people is, uh, you know, what you really, you, you really need to have this notion of what we call front end ethics, which is a, a term we, we uh, co-opted for one of our investors, Low Tony. And what that means to us is like, you don't, don't just build a system, put it out there and then sort of like, as an afterthought, like kind of think about what impact this is having on the world, but really from like before the project's approved, as you're assembling data, as you're starting to design algorithms, you know, make sure that there's a there's sort of a, an ethical lens the entire way through so that by the time it gets into production, you're already like confident that it may not be perfect, but it's, it's you know, there's not any real obvious negative impacts that it's going to be having. Fantastic. Okay, well, everyone, thank you so much for taking time to chat. Um, great discussion. Thank you. Thanks for having us.